Melanie, welcome to Happy Place. It's so lovely to, to virtually meet you today. I know, thanks for having me on. It's a shame it can't be in person. <laughs> I know, whereabouts are you today? I'm in Glasgow. You're in Glasgow, okay. And you've got the Commonwealth Games quite literally round the corner. How are you feeling? How's the preparation going? Yeah, it's coming around quick. I think we're three weeks out now. So um, yeah, it's all super exciting. It's kind of like last preparations now, just fine tuning and um, yeah, just looking forward to it. So you're a wheelchair racer in the, you know, do you say T54 or T54 category? T54. T54 category. Um, so how many races have you got coming up in the Commonwealth? So because it's an integrated event, um, our, our events are limited. So it's just the 1500 meters that we have. Um, so yeah, a little bit longer than I would be liking to do, but um, excited for it. And what is the training preparation for that? Like, how long have you been training for this specific event coming up? What kind of training do you get stuck into before an event of this size? So, I mean, this summer has kind of been geared towards uh, the Commonwealth Games. So we've kind of been looking at this event thinking, you know, this is going to be the big one. So, you know, my training, I train six days a week, uh, usually kind of two sessions in a day. And that's like a huge mix of being on the track strength and conditioning in the gym um, yeah quite a number of things that kind of are getting me ready to, to race and as well as the the physical prep and the physical training that you obviously have scheduled in so you know that you're you're on track to to get to that event and do your best on that particular day what about mentally how do you mentally prepare yourself for such a thing where you've got all eyes on you everybody wants you to win everybody's cheering you on you want to win it means an awful lot to you how do you get in the right mental state to be under that amount of pressure I mean I definitely don't look at it like that <laughs> oh, I made it otherwise, worse. I, <laughs> otherwise I think I would feel a lot of pressure <laughs> um but for me I think I'm still fairly new to this sport so I'm just taking each experience as it comes. Um, I think I'm really looking forward to having a crowd there and, you know, having my friends, my family cheer me on. But I think I'm kind of looking at it as like, you know, at the experience that it will be, you know, what can I do? What performance can I put out under those pressures? Um, and that will be really a big learning, a learning experience for me. So, yeah, I guess I'm more just looking at it as like my own performance. What can I do? You know, can I do my best uh, under those circumstances? And, you know, hopefully I can. Because your debut was at the Paralympics in Tokyo, right? Yeah. And how was how was that experience? I mean, I, I, I can't imagine the excitement slash I'm imagining some nerves and fear thrown into the mix too. Yeah, a whole a whole host of those. I, I, I Tokyo for me was not part of the plan. I didn't expect to be there. So I guess I was just kind of absor absorbing it all and yeah, taking it all in. But, you know, as someone who's, fairly new to even the world of disability it was just a, such an eye-opening experience you know to see so many different athletes uh, incredible stories you know achieving amazing things you know despite potential challenges they might have faced was just like it was just amazing to even see that so I think I was just excited to be part of it all and um yeah just take it all in yeah I can't even imagine how amazing that atmosphere was but of course it was there was extra complications in the fact that you had lockdowns beforehand. And we've spoken to different athletes on the show already about the challenges that you all faced during that time. How did you train during all the lockdowns? Yeah, to, to be honest, training gave me the structure through lockdowns. You know, we were all needing something to keep us sane. And for me, having the structure in the day and having that as a goal was like so important and I think it's just a reminder that we all need that in life you know we need a routine we need structure and um training gave me that I guess it was kind of lonely in some ways you know an individual sport training on your own uh, twice a day can be yeah a bit of a strange a strange one but um I think I you know I wouldn't have been at Tokyo hadn't we got those locked to have hadn't we had Covid and the, you know the extra time to prepare for the game so yeah I guess I just grabbed that with with both hands and was like you know how hard can I work during this time and you know hopefully there'll be light at the end of the tunnel. As you said a moment ago you're you're new to the world of disability you you had a, an accident in 2018 so really not that far back at all you know I never 
um, move into territory like this lightly because I know retelling stories can be traumatic, triggering. It's um, it's a big deal to to retell stories. But do you mind sharing any of your story today? Yeah. So I think I mean it's an important part of my journey. I 2018 was out for a cycle um just a Saturday afternoon you know pretty pretty normal circumstances and I was hit by a car just a passing driver that completely didn't see me and the result of that were some pretty significant injuries um the most significant of that I guess was the break to my back and the damage to my spinal cord which ultimately left me with kind of little to no movement below my hips and you know I was looking at living life now as a wheelchair user. So when you when I know that it, you, you when you got to hospital you were told pretty short after that you wouldn't be able to to walk again how do you cope with processing such life-changing information like that? I, I think I you know when I looked at the whole and you know what that would mean for my life going forward that that was scary that was like sad it was overwhelming you know it was something that I I would say I couldn't process so it then really turned to like okay today what you know what are we doing today what does tomorrow look like because that was the only way I could really comprehend that or look at my recovery um and move forward yeah because I know that you said that um there was sort of a gradual development to uh, you understanding what was going to be possible after your accident and how much you'd be able to do, how much you wouldn't be able to do. What did that process involve? How, how did you work through that process of, of seeing how much you could actually achieve, how much you could do? Yeah, I think at first it was like, I was like, I was almost grieving all the things that I thought I couldn't do or or I actually couldn't know you know I would no longer be able to do so um so yeah that was kind of that was the scary part and to be honest my ignorance and my lack of knowledge on you know what living life with a disability looks like um you know that made me fearful that made me think like I have no idea you know what what my life's going to look like so I guess as time went on and I started to speak to people and learn actually like what's possible um I think that's what yeah that's what kind of got me motivated and allowed me to start moving forward and thinking about what's next because I was like actually you know there's so much more possible than I thought and yeah that's kind of what got me excited about what was next. So obviously your your rehabilitation and, and your recovery was was lengthy but you've obviously been introduced to the sport quite quite quickly at what point did you discover wheelchair racing who who introduced you to it as soon as I came out of hospital I was like okay I was thinking about sport I was like what can I get involved in you know what can I do now that I didn't before um and I was really open to trying a number of things I think there's something super special about para sport and the way that you know you could go to a club and there could be complete beginners or recreational athletes but also like Paralympians or you know elite sports people so when I got started at um, the local athletics club that's what I saw I saw like you know people that were making a career out of this and uh, were achieving incredible things so as soon as I went down to the athletics club you know I was like excited about the progression and um, when I could get started and you know how how far I could go in the sport. And so at what point did you think yeah this is this is for me, you know, was it kind of love at first sight with the sport or did it take a little while to go, okay, I think there's there's some potential here for me to be really good at this? Um, I don't think I've ever thought that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it wasn't, it definitely wasn't immediate. I don't know if you've seen a racing wheelchair, but they are not made for comfort. So when I first sat in one, I was like, oh my goodness, this is awful. <laughs> I was also really, really bad, very slow. So I think, but I think that was kind of the beauty of it. Like I was not good. I wasn't like, no one said to me, oh, you're, you know, you're going to be good. You're going to be amazing at this. But I was like, I can only get better. So I think that was kind of like motivated me to, you know, try and get going and work hard to see how good I could get. 
I mean, you said a moment ago that it was a surprise to be at Tokyo. How come? How, what was your journey from that moment to then debuting at Tokyo? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I was two, two and a half years into the sport um, come Tokyo. So when selection was being made, I didn't really see myself as, you know, being in the lineup. And um, But when I started, I, yeah, I guess I just started to train hard. I um, was determined to get better. I continued to race to, to improve my times. And um, as time went on, you know, my times were improving and I was getting closer to kind of that standard that, you'd need to meet to, to get to get selected so yeah it was just a gradual progression you know of over that time just continuing to grind out and and see how much better I could get. So was there a moment where you thought okay right this is I'm enjoying this this is a great challenge I'm making new friends there feels like a sense of community to okay this is now this is a this is a serious high-end career option for me. Yeah, I think it was the start of that summer. I got my selection, my first GB selection to represent Great Britain at the Europeans. But that was eye opening. You know, I was against other athletes that I thought, you know, I can't even compete with. So, um, but as the summer went on, I continued to improve. And I was like, like, if this is how far I can get within this amount of time. Or when I was at Tokyo, I was like, if I can be against some of these athletes at this point, like I know for Paris in 2024 that, you know, I want to be there, you know, really being competitive and not just there for the experience. Yeah. So I'm imagining training ups from now till Paris, right? Yeah. I know that um, it's, it'll come around super quick. I think that it seems like far away just now, but you know, as we go through the years, it'll, it'll be around before we know it. So it's just like, taking everything I can get from the, the racing that I'm doing at the moment, but also, you know, continuing to, to look for improvements and, and get better and hone the craft of, of wheelchair racing. So you've got the Commonwealth and then after that, are you just like Paris Paralympics all the way? You're just, that's your focus? Yeah, next year we'll have a world championship. So that'll kind of be the stepping stone to, to go to Paris in 2024. So you know, next year will be a big year. And again, we'll go into a winter of training before we hit the big year of the Paralympics again. So it's kind of nonstop. Do you ever have days where you're just like, I haven't got it in me today. I haven't got the mental capacity. I'm physically exhausted. I don't want to train. How do you motivate yourself if you do have those moments? Yeah, I definitely do. I definitely, you know, think I can't be bothered or, you know, this is hard but I think I just remind myself that I can do hard things and you know actually starting training or you know you know beginning something can be the hardest part but you know I think it's just having that kind of like discipline and self-belief that you know once you start you've got it in you and um, I think that's kind of what's taken me through you know whether it's my recovery or into the sport so it's just a, it's something I just remind myself of. I guess also like most things in life that do require hard work, seeing any sort of progress, that's motivating in itself, I guess. Yeah, and I think as adults, we can be so scared to try something new, you know, like we can be so fearful of uh, being bad at something. But, you know, I had a really, I had a blank page, which gave me the opportunity to do that. And I think like if I encourage anybody to do you know, to try something new, to try things that scare them because like you can only get better and that can be a really satisfying feeling. Yeah, you're so right. I think, you know, it's a given that kids will try new things almost weekly. They'll give something new a go or try a new experience, but we get quite stuck in a rut with, yeah, no, this is what I do. I don't do this or I don't want a new hobby, but actually it's so liberating to try something new and it's such a a good way of just like shaking things up and getting new perspectives and I guess also like discovering new parts of yourself along the way yeah and you'll find things that are like that are not for you but you'll you could find things that you know like will bring you a lot of excitement and a lot of challenge and you know we just have to have to continue to try new things to find that what would you say to anybody out there wanting to try a para sport for the first time who feels perhaps apprehensive or nervous I think, yeah, don't be, don't be afraid of the challenge. Uh, try as many things as you can. And 
yeah I think trying as many things as you can is is so important because you know not everything will be for you you just got to give it a go and see what what floats your boat yeah exactly what floats your boat what floats your boat and then just do more of it whatever feels good do more of it so look we've got the commonwealth coming up very very soon you're in the midst of training are you training later today i'm imagining yeah (laughs) okay so what when you're on that start line and you're waiting to just give it your all what is going through your head do you try and clear it or is there a specific thought a mantra what's going on cognitively for you I think it's about clearing it you know um quite often we can have so many different thoughts muddling our mind and um again under those pressures the last thing I'm wanting to be doing is deciphering which ones are useful and which ones are not so so yeah being able to clear my mind and just be present in that moment I think will be really helpful for me and then what about when you're racing do you think of anything is it even possible to I think it's on the race it's you know it's (laughs) <laughs> what can be done within the race what I'm focusing on um technically and tactically so yeah that's really what I'm thinking about I mean whenever we've had athletes on the show before quite often they speak of this sort of flow state that you get into where there isn't really any thought and it almost feels effortless because you've done the work you've done the prep and then in that moment you're able to just use the adrenaline to focus and do what you need to do do you experience that when you're when you're in a a national or international race yeah I think you you know you practice what you do day in day out so in that moment it's leaving up to you know believing that you can do it and you do it every day and you know you just need to it's just another day it's just another race you know without putting the pressures of it being international or being a championship race I think being able to do that allows you to just go out, enjoy it and, you know, kind of enjoy the experience for what it is. How the hell do you do that, though? Do you know what I mean? I I often will have something nerve wracking coming up. I mean, nowhere near as nerve wracking as taking part in the Commonwealth Games or the Paralympics. But certainly things where I'm putting the pressure on myself because I want to do it well. I want it to go as well as possible. And of course, in the world of sport, you have to sort of, you, the end game is perfection if you want to win, isn't it? Like that's the, the goal is, if you want to get a gold medal, it is the perfect race. So how do you stop that pressure from, from taking over? I have so not nailed that one. Yeah, I don't think I have either. I think that's definitely a learning, um, a learning element of the sport. And I think for me, I have to remind myself of why I'm doing this you know is in some ways a selfish pursuit to see what I can achieve in the sport and you know it's to to gain opportunities from you know the kind of life-changing event that happens so in that sense it's important to me to do well but I think I remind myself that my friends my family those that are important to me will be proud no matter what so putting that pressure on myself and you know thinking that the only outcome for me that would be successful is to is to win or to do well is um is overwhelming so I think I just kind of need to take it back to the simplicity of why I'm doing this and and try and enjoy it because you know before my injury and before my accident I would never have experienced anything like this so so trying to yeah trying to appreciate that is is important Three weeks to go. So much has gone into putting the Commonwealth Games together with the help from a huge team and obviously the help from the National Lottery players. And it looks to be an amazing spectacle. How are the nerves? Is excitement overriding the nerves? Where are you at with that? Yeah, uh, it's definitely, uh, it can be a mix. Like, you know, that way where, as you say, you can get super nervous and you can overthink it and you know, trying to get to sleep but the night before can pull. Oh, wow, it can be hard. Yeah. Um, I'm a, I, I have to say I'm a good sleeper. So oh, I definitely, thing. <laughs> I know I'm grateful for that because head on the pillow, I'm away. <laughs> I love that. I, I, again, I'm, I have not nailed that one. I am a terrible sleeper, especially if I've got things rumbling around my head. What about if doubt creeps in? How do you deal with moments of doubt? that's a that's a good one moments of doubt 
I think you get on the start line, like I always feel like I can't do this or I'm going to be bad like I always that goes through my mind like this is going to go badly and I I think that's just your or that's fear like that's being scared of what we're about to do but as soon as I cross the finish line it's like oh that was great I love it so like I have to almost remind myself that that's coming and this is just like my brain kicking in and saying like this is scary and you know that's just that's like a process that repeats constantly so um of course it's a strange way our mind works it is but I think that's a really good way of putting it that you have to I mean I, I certainly do in my own tiny way remember that that is part of the process like I'm going to feel absolutely bloody awful and be terrified and every bad voice is going to pop up into my head telling me I'm not capable of doing this this and this and then I get to the bit where I do the job or I do the thing and it's a different experience so I think that's rather than trying to banish that bit and go, no, 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 this bit can't be happening, which makes it even, it ramps it up even more. It is actually really, I think, again, a healthy um, mindset to go, this is just part of the process. This is part of it and it will pass and there'll then be like the next phase or the next feeling that comes. Yeah, it's like listening to the voices, isn't it? Oh, never listen to that voice <laughs> in the head. Never, <laughs> never listen to it. You've got to follow the heart. How vital is funding from the National Lottery for para sports? do you think? Yeah, the National Lottery funding gives us access to world-class facilities. That's, you know, that's where we train, that's the resources that we can get access to, and that allows us to be the best that we can be. It also, it also creates a pathway for us into elite sports. So for me, I'm relatively new and I've seen that pathway and how supportive it can be, you know, to getting you to the top level. So um, yeah, it's crucial. It's vital in, in getting us to be our best. It's amazing. I mean, it's very interesting. Whenever I talk either on the podcast or to people outside of work, wheelchair users specifically, about these big celebrations, whether it be the Paralympics, the Commonwealth Games, uh, the, the, the World Championships, there's such support and celebration for the disability community. But then so, so often when I've spoken to people, there feels like there's a lull afterwards outside of sport in the real world where that support and celebration dwindles. How have you found that over the last few years and what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I think it's very evident that we have this kind of inspiration bubble of Paralympians and it was a very strange experience for me to go into disability sport and for people to automatically say, oh, are you going to the Paralympics? And, you know, I was like, no, I'm, I, I'm awful at this. <laughs> I'm absolutely not. But that was our association with uh, those with disabilities and those with disabilities in sport. You know, that's, that's our reference. So um, I think it's important. Yeah, we appreciate Paralympians and para-athletes for what they've achieved, you know, in sport and as elite sports people like that's that's incredible um but also recognize that that's not what everyone wants to be you know that's not what all with disabilities want to be some some just want to take part in sport recreationally or you know they want to keep fit they want to be active and not necessarily be put on the the pedestal of being a Paralympian and you know with reference to that be then not achieving if they don't get to that level so yeah, it's a, it's a super complex one. You know, I think whenever I hear the word inspiration, it, it's conflicted because I feel grateful that someone, you know, might see me as an inspiration or motivated to get into sport or be active because, you know, they see that you can be if you have a disability. But it's definitely, yeah, there's definitely a conflict in, in opinion and, and the kind of reasons why we see Paralympians with a disability as inspirations. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you echo the thoughts of all other guests we've had on the podcast who ha have the same experience of people using the word inspirational without thought or without realising what impact it has, uh, without that undercurrent of ableism. And, um, you know, as we've said time and time before in this space, there's clearly so much that needs to be done in terms of physical practical and emotional support for the disability community that that does not exist does not exist but it's amazing I, yeah go on sorry Mel 
No, I was just going to say, if, I, if I'm an inspiration for, you know, overcoming the, the challenges that have faced me or, you know, the, the kind of adversity that I've managed to overcome, then, you know, absolutely. But if I'm an inspiration for going out and about in my wheelchair, you know, doing my normal day to day things, then, you know, that that definitely has problems. Yeah, without a doubt, without a doubt. So right, we've got, what, three weeks to go, did you say at the start? The countdown is on. Three weeks to go. How are the nerves right now? Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah, three weeks will come around quick. I know it. <laughs> I mean, you're going to literally <laughs> blink and you're going to be on the start line. It's going to be that quick. But I wish you all the love and luck with it. And I really hope that the rest of your training for the next three weeks, where I'm sure it intensifies somewhat, goes really, really well. And um, we'll all be cheering you on and are just so excited to see how you do without pressure uh, in the Commonwealth and also in Paris. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thanks, Melanie.